by the end of today's video, you will never look at music the same way again. Your level of appreciation will have permanently leveled up. I guarantee it. Why do we like music? I mean, it makes us feel good, but why does it make us feel good? Dan Levitin released the book, This Is Your Brain on Music in 2008, and it made great strides in helping the average person understand what music does to your brain. One of the things we found is that music engages nearly every region of the brain that we've mapped so far. And uh, what you can see here in this diagram are some of those regions. When you're looking at the left hemisphere of the brain. We've got this area in the front that's involved in expectancy generation. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. While an incredible book and necessary, Levinton didn't fully answer the question why we like music. Someone might answer, music makes us feel good emotionally. That's why we like it. While that's true, it's kind of circular logic. Even Levitin went substantially further than that. Another person might say, music releases dopamine in the brain, similar to other pleasurable activities. It also turns out that inside the brain, uh, there are structures that are part of a, a well-known reward center, including the nucleus accumbens and the amygdala. These are areas, for decades, we've known that they start firing when people have rewarding or pleasurable experiences such as taking drugs like opium or heroin, uh, having sex, eating chocolate, if you're a gambler and you win a bet. And this reward circuit is involved with your neurochemistry. What happens is it modulates dopamine, the so-called feel-good hormone. It modulates its release and its uptake in response to these pleasurable experiences. And in my lab a couple of years ago, we published a study showing that if you listen to music that you like, these same regions come online. The neurons start to fire in response to hearing music that you like. Levitin observed this, and that is accurate, but our brain can release dopamine from a variety of different activities. Just saying, because dopamine is also insufficient to capturing the real why of music. We release dopamine from exercise, human interaction, eating, copulation, recreational substances, and of course, listening to music. What do all of these things have in common? Why do they all release dopamine? When evaluating all of these activities, one might think that all these activities touch primal instincts. We satisfy these primal instincts by engaging in these activities, and our brains evolved to reward us when we satisfy those primal desires. You would be super close to a satisfactory answer. You would be one step away. Why does the brain reward us for satisfying primal desires? Before we answer that question, there's one more activity that releases dopamine that we haven't talked about yet. And I think it's the key to unlocking this mystery for us. Did you know that you release dopamine when you learn something new? Yes, novel experiences are one of the biggest dopamine hits you can get. You could call that activity experience, understanding, or knowledge. Knowledge. And knowledge is something we have an intense instinct for. Today, you will be introduced to the knowledge instinct, that innate drive that demands people learn new things and better understand the world around them. Baked into the knowledge instinct is the science of why music creates meaning for us. By the end of today's video, your understanding of music and art will be taken to a new level. You'll gain an appreciation you never thought possible. Hey everyone, welcome back to this series on the meaning of music, where we are examining the book Music, Passion, and Cognitive Function by Leonid Perlovsky, and we explore his revolutionary theory on music and art. I encourage all of you to pick up your own copy of the book at the link in the description, both to broaden your understanding of the musical experience and to support the man who dedicated years of his life to this work. Before we begin, I wanted to take a moment to thank everyone who watched the first installment of this series. While it didn't get as many views as I had hoped, the amount of people who expressed such gratitude and fulfillment watching that video was very meaningful to me. Even though the video did not perform as well as I'd hoped, it's a sign to me that I need to continue forward with this series, so thank you. It's a topic that I think people are starving to understand better, and it's a very real passion of mine. 
Because this video series is such a risk for me, it would mean the world to me if you would consider supporting the channel. Supporting by becoming a member through Subscribestar by clicking the link in the description, or you can send me a tip directly through PayPal to becomethenight at gmail.com. Those are my preferred methods. If neither of those suit your fancy, you can always become a member of the channel. The little extra money goes a long way for me each month, and I cannot thank you enough for your support. I wanted to quickly summarize the previous video, but before we do, I think it's important to reiterate Perlovsky's theory on the origin of meaning in music to help focus on the unifying concept for this series and better help you understand why we're doing all of this groundwork. Perlovsky claims that music is an ability evolved to resolve cognitive dissonances. When Proto-Man evolved into Homo sapien as we know him today, our ability to collect information became so powerful, more powerful than any other species on the planet, that we needed to evolve the ability of music as an adaptation to compensate. He acknowledges this is not the only utility of music, but that it's a fundamental part of understanding the meaning of music, why it's so important to individuals and cultures, and why it's ubiquitous across every culture. Okay, so in our last video, I summarized the first chapter of Perlovsky's book as best I could, doing a long distance sprint through musicology from ancient Greece, the whole way up to current day scientific theories. All of these theories were on music's origin and purpose, all of which Perlovsky finds very useful, but none of which he finds fully sufficient. There was a ton of information in there, and I know it was a lot for everyone to digest, even in 40 minutes. Like I said, in order to fully appreciate the gravity of Perlovsky's theory, there's a lot of groundwork that has to be laid. Today is another groundwork video, but thankfully, the chapters from here on out are split into more manageable, understandable, focused chunks so we can digest these foundational ideas in a much more manageable way. And instead of flying through several thousand years of dense history, we're focusing on one region of psychology, the knowledge instinct, how it relates to the hierarchy of concepts, and how these both relate to music. The knowledge instinct and the hierarchy of concepts are keys to understanding why music is so meaningful to us and why we need music to function as a species. If you're still not convinced that we need to do all of this groundwork in order to understand Perlovsky's theory, I'll go ahead and spoil the ending of the video for you right now. The knowledge instinct influencing our hierarchy of concepts is where we derive meaning and appreciate aesthetic. The concepts located at all areas of the hierarchy are motivated by instinct and connected upwards or downwards by emotions. When a lower level concept is contextualized better within the highest level concepts, that's when human beings find meaning and beauty. Music aids greatly in this process. That probably means nothing to you, but that statement contains several psychological processes, all of which require music in order to function healthfully. It's explaining part of the real utility of music, a very important part. I am going to repeat that statement at the end of today's video, and I promise you, you are not only going to understand it, you are going to have a substantial amount of meaning attached to that statement by the time we're done. But what does psychology have to do with music, Mike? Well, arguably everything. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to experience or enjoy music if our brains weren't processing it. And psychology is the study of how our brains process everything. By the end of today's video, you will be grateful that we went through all of this groundwork. Perlovsky believes that music is essential to how humans acquire understanding and meaning. Not just thinking of music as an emotionally satisfying anomaly, but how music applies to our most basic cognitive processes. Understanding the fundamentals of cognition is crucial to understanding Perlovsky's argument. So we're going to have to dig into some neuroscience. I've tried my best to trim the fat and only address the concepts that are necessary to understand why music is so important to our daily brain functions. Functions that are so fundamental yet complex that we take them for granted or don't even realize they're happening.
I'm sure at this point you're probably curious as to what the knowledge instinct is. The meaning is in the name, our instinct to want to collect more knowledge. But Mike, how does innately wanting to learn more relate to our love of music? That's really the question. On the surface, they seem unrelated, but to understand how they are intimately tied and inseparable, we need to break down the knowledge instinct, or KI for short, into its basic components and learn how they interact. First, we need to understand the four basic mechanisms of the mind. They are concepts, instincts, emotions, and behavior. You've heard all of these words before, but you probably don't know how they all relate to each other. Let's define each of these so we can examine how they all work together. Since we don't really need a deep understanding of behavior in order to get this theory, we're going to barely touch on that. Concepts. When you hear the word concept, it instantly teleports you back to school, being bored out of your mind by a teacher droning on about things you could not care less about. But without realizing it, your brain is packed with millions of concepts and has the potential to hold more than we can count. For a simple example of a concept, we have a cup. What is a cup? According to Oxford Dictionary, a cup is a small, bowl-shaped container for drinking from, typically having a handle. We have the appearance, small, bowl-shaped container. We have the function, for drinking from, and a possible variable, typically having a handle. Okay, simple enough, right? Now, I want you to picture a cup in your mind. Close your eyes, imagine a cup, and imagine as much granular detail as you can about that cup. See it as clearly in your mind's eye as possible. I'll give you a few moments to do this. Okay, do you have the picture in your mind? Very good. Did your cup look like this? I'm going to assume not, since this is a very strange looking cup, but given enough time to contextualize all the elements of the object on screen, you could identify it as a cup, even though it looked completely different from the cup you imagined in your mind. And while it does have elements that remind you of the concept of a toilet, you better matched it to Oxford's definition of a cup. That's because the concept of a cup is not a specific object. That's why, if you chose, you could imagine an infinite number of different looking cups, though they are all cups. Contrary to what you'd expect, concepts are actually semi-vague models, neural representations that operate as mental models of objects or events. The models need to stay vague so they can be malleable to different variables in your environment. Shape, color, situation, function, position, lighting in the room. In order for your brain to understand that all of these different objects are cups, your model of a cup needs to be pliable to ever-changing circumstances. When we see something, our mind's eye projects an image onto our visual cortex, which is compared to the image projected from the retina. That is, our mental model is compared to the stimulus. When the two images are successfully matched, that is what we call perception. We just used an easy example of a simple everyday object, but like I had said before, not all concepts are models of objects. There is an entire hierarchy of concepts, with simpler concepts being towards the bottom, and more complex and abstract concepts such as a nation, the good of society, and moral concepts towards the top. We will be diving deeper into the hierarchy of concepts later in this video, but first, we need to finish examining all of the mechanisms of the mind. But for now, that's a solid description of concepts. Instincts. Instincts are the natural tendency of a living organism to exhibit a specific, complex behavior that includes innate or inborn elements. In plain English, it's tendencies or skills you're born with. Your ability to perceive and learn is an instinct. Your ability to eat is an instinct. A dog shaking after it gets wet, baby sea turtles seeking the ocean after just hatching. 
These are all examples of instinctual behavior. Instincts are similar to our internal sensors that measure our vital parameters. They're both important for normal functioning and survival. Perlovsky gives the example of when we have low blood sugar levels, it activates our instinct for food. The sensor measurement and the need to maintain sugar levels appropriate for our bodies is a mechanism of instinct. Different species are born with different types of instincts, and scientists tend to observe instincts as necessary for survival or behaviors that help a species compete in nature. Simple enough. Emotions. Emotions are significantly more complicated, but for the sake of today's video, I'm going to simplify them substantially just so we can better understand the knowledge instinct. Emotions are brain signals that connect instincts to concepts. We experience emotions as feelings, but they are signals that encourage us to behave in ways that satisfy our instinctual desires. For most people, how we feel about something plays some part in our decision making. For an extreme example, do you ever have really strong emotions that cause you to act in a certain way that you wish you hadn't? That is your instincts using emotions to influence your behavior. It influences how you interpret and respond to concepts. Emotions literally communicate instinctual needs to the conceptual part of the brain. This further contextualizes objects and events so we can evaluate them based upon our instinctual desires. If they align with those desires, they receive preferential attention and processing resources in the brain. That preferential attention can make it more difficult to control your behavior. Okay, so we've defined the important mechanisms of the mind for this theory, and we've examined how they all work together. So to boil it all down, emotions evaluate concepts for the purpose of instinct satisfaction. Emotions connect instincts to concepts. This is important because like we talked about in the last video, music is communicating emotions. This means that music touches us in our deepest, most innate desires. But why does it do that? We will come back to this. Perlovsky emphasizes that most psychological research on emotions relates to the most basic ones, the emotions we have words for, like happy, sad, distressed, shock, wonder, peaceful, and many others. In the last video, we looked at the gem scale, which attempted to be an exhaustive look at what emotions music evokes in people. This is where most research stops. Perlovsky says, while these appear to be a large number of emotions, we have over 150 words in the English language to describe emotions, they are but a tiny fraction of the emotions we experience. While these 150 words describe the most ancient and salient emotions, Perlovsky describes the following. Our higher cognitive abilities involve a virtual infinity of continuous emotions, which are not described by specific words. These include emotions in the prosody of voice, emotions of cognitive dissonances, as well as music emotions. Perlovsky highlights these three because they are the ones that pertain most to his theory, but he says there are many more. To briefly touch on behavior, when our concepts and emotions work to help us understand our world, they result in action. That could be bodily action or mental action. And most behavior takes place in the mind without you even realizing it's happening. The act of understanding something is itself a behavior. So you can see how this would almost act as a rapid cascade of cause and effect. The behavior of understanding leads to another behavior of understanding leads to an endless etc. <laughs> so now we know the basic mechanisms of the mind and how they interact. Instincts relate to concepts by emotions and this results in behavior. Sweet. But what the heck does this have to do with music, Mike? Remember when I was talking about the vagueness of concept models? And remember when I was talking about the hierarchy of concepts? Well, the higher up the concept hierarchy you go, the more vague these concepts become. 
it's in that vagueness where the music emotions come into play. We'll be able to experience a taste of that in this video now that we know the mechanisms of the mind, because now we can explain the knowledge instinct. To satisfy instinctual desires, the brain has to perceive the objects and situations around them. We need to know what's happening around us to know how to behave. Our concept model needs to match the stimulus coming into the brain. But objects and situations are never exactly identical to previously encountered circumstances. If we think about the cup from before, looking at it from a different angle, different lighting, different location or orientation. Maybe it's a new kind of cup that you've never seen before. Again, this is why our concept models are vague, so they can be malleable. But because the models are vague, they never completely match. They only approximately match. So how can we know we're understanding what we're experiencing if the model never completely matches the stimulus? To actually perceive objects, our mind needs to modify the concept model to match. So the concept fits the real object or situation. We do this without ever controlling it. It is our innate ability. Perlovsky says this is an ability more innate than wanting food. It is aimed at satisfying a basic need to understand the world around us by making concept models similar to the surroundings. The mind has an inborn instinct that senses this similarity and maximizes it. This instinct is the knowledge instinct. So to summarize, the knowledge instinct is our innate ability to modify concept models to fit concrete objects observed, or a desire to understand the world around us by modifying concept models to fit our surroundings. Each time a novel stimulus is matched to an existing concept, the model updates to include that new information. When your model updates and integrates into the rest of your brain, that's called knowledge. knowledge. Oxford defines knowledge as facts, information, and skills acquired by a person through experience or education. But a more specific and accurate definition of knowledge would be the measure of correspondence between one's concepts and the world. You could say philosophically how our personal understanding of the world aligns with reality or objective truth. I wanted to thank you quickly for your patience in learning these concepts, because now we're on the verge of very solidly tying this back to music and art in general. Remember when Perlovsky highlighted that there is a seemingly infinite continuous flow of emotions? Well, there are emotions specifically associated with the knowledge instinct. We call them aesthetic emotions. These emotions are continuously flowing through us. As Perlovsky says, they are inseparable from every act of perception and cognition. During the perception of everyday objects, these emotions usually are below the threshold of conscious registrations, but they become more pronounced in certain circumstances. One of those circumstances is when we engage with art and music. Art and music play with us in the most substantial way by evoking our aesthetic emotions. Well, that's neat, Mike, but what exactly are aesthetic emotions? I'm so happy you asked. Aesthetic emotions are emotions that evaluate satisfaction or dissatisfaction regarding one's knowledge instinct. They are felt as a harmony or disharmony between one's knowledge and the world. Perlovsky describes them as not related to lower bodily needs, but only to the higher need for knowledge. In this sense, they are higher, spiritual, aesthetic emotions. Kant was the first to call the emotions related to knowledge as aesthetic, and it's been a consistent practice since. This is very difficult to explain without getting substantially sidetracked for much further. So instead of explaining it, I'll just demonstrate it so you can experience what he means. Look at this picture of a Japanese cherry blossom. What do you feel when you see it? 
it's nice. It's pretty. There's something about it that touches you in a meaningful way. Even if it isn't necessarily your preference, there's something about it that connects with you. That part of you that the picture touches and feels meaningful, those are the aesthetic emotions. This is a simple example of satisfying one's knowledge instinct, bringing harmony between one's knowledge and the world. A bit of beauty, a bit of wonder, and we know these are aesthetic emotions because more context will impact them greatly. So let me give you the story around this picture. What if I told you there was an old Japanese hermit who lived in that little shed? He lived in that shed as a hermit because many years ago, his wife and two children died when their village was ransacked by barbarians. After the barbarians left the village, he, in his frustration, agony, and embarrassment, took his deceased loved ones away and buried them in the wilderness, too ashamed to be seen by the surviving villagers. To atone for failing to protect them, he built that shed and vowed never to leave their sides until his death. He patiently guarded their graves for 50 years until finally joining them in the peace of the afterlife. That cherry blossom tree is a sign of his love and dedication to his family. People say the tree is actually the spirit of the old hermit, watching over his family's graves. It shelters them even after his death, just like the hermit's heart, perpetually yearning to atone for failing to protect them. Now, the aesthetic emotions you're experiencing from this picture are more profound. You're still experiencing the same beauty emotions you did when we first looked at the tree, but with more context, an additional, stronger meaning was elicited. Now, I am sorry to say I just made that story up and I found that image by typing in most beautiful picture into Google, but you can see how changing context can impact the kind of aesthetic emotions we experience. It takes something that might be mildly meaningful or vaguely meaningful and makes the meaning more tangible and pronounced. The context of the story related the picture more concretely to existing higher concepts and drew out stronger aesthetic emotions because of it. We'll explore this more when we reach the hierarchy of concepts. This is Loab, the AI demon cryptid who there's no real explanation for. A musician named Super Composite was messing around with AI images using text prompts. He was experimenting with negative prompt weights like what is the exact opposite of Marlon Brando, and he would get some bizarre skyline with cryptic lettering. When he asked for the exact opposite of that picture, he got this picture and named it Loab. He experimented with combining Loab with other prompts, and that made the results grossly violent, gory, and horrific. He had trouble combining pictures with Loab that didn't have her somewhere in the result, all of them very unsettling, most of them gory. It took a substantial amount of effort to try and get results that weren't dark or macabre when the images were touched by Loab. This unsettling feeling you get seeing Loab, or when I tell you the strange story surrounding her, this is also your aesthetic emotions at play. This is the dissatisfaction related to the knowledge instinct, resulting in disharmony. It relates to meaning, but in a horrifying way, almost as though Loab is threatening that which you hold dear. Now, these are both visual examples, and with more context, they become more meaningful. But even with no context, art can still be extremely meaningful and impactful, even if we don't know how to put it into words. In the description of this video, I have seven links to pieces of music, in order to properly demonstrate, I would like for you to listen to those after the conclusion of the video. Listen with your eyes closed so that you can't see the titles of the works, the composers, or the performers. I'm hoping to give you as little context as possible so that you can try to derive meaning and enjoyment from them with no semantic information. You should do so after the video to get the full effect. Art and especially music, can still be extremely meaningful to us, 
even if at first it appears ambiguous or abstract. There is something objective about it that has a core of meaning that we can't quite touch, that manifests differently in each of our own interpretations. It speaks directly to our emotions without contextual aid. That is powerful. So we know music engages aesthetic emotions, and we know aesthetic emotions relate to the knowledge instinct. But how exactly does that make music directly translate to meaning? We have one more piece of the puzzle. This is the approximate hierarchy of concepts. There are a few models for hierarchy of the mind, but the model we are looking at today applies specifically to concept models and how we understand the world. Concepts are ranked by complexity and ambiguity, with the simplest concepts being at the bottom, objects. The next level up in the hierarchy are situations with more complexity and nuance than simple objects. And finally, at the top, we have abstract concepts, the most complex and ambiguous. The direction lines in between each tier signify that there are constant signals driven by the knowledge instinct. Signals going up, or bottom-up signals, and signals coming down, or top-down signals. At every level of the hierarchy, top-down signals are matched with bottom-up signals, and at every level of the hierarchy, there are aesthetic emotions that appear when these signals meet. If the signals are in harmony, you feel positive aesthetic emotions. If the signals are dissonant, there is disharmony and you feel negative aesthetic emotions. This constant signal movement between the tiers is your brain attempting to understand how the lower level concepts pertain to the higher level concepts and vice versa. Perlovsky states that music plays a crucial role in the movement of these signals. But before we explore music's role, let's demonstrate the hierarchy of concepts with something we all love, a guitar store. Okay, so let's say you're in a building. You know this building you're in is a guitar store. But how do you know it's a guitar store? Well, let's break it down by the hierarchy of concepts. When evaluating sensory motor signals, we hear music playing, we hear guitar playing, we hear people talking, there's a distinct smell. The carpet you're walking on is tough. What objects are there? Well, there's some guitars, there's some guitar players, sales associates, some strings, amplifiers, walls, books, drums. What kind of situations do you encounter? Well, sitting down, playing guitar, making a purchase, having a conversation, doing a cost-benefit analysis, fantasizing about buying expensive gear, meeting new people. Observing all of these things, you can safely assume you're probably in a guitar store. Mike, obviously it's a guitar store. It's in the definition, it's in the name a store that sells guitars. It may seem easy for us to understand, and it is, but please do not underappreciate just how complex of a process this is and how we do this evaluation multiple times a day without ever thinking about it, and it happens like that. Your dog doesn't understand the concept of money, and frankly, most people don't either. And your dog doesn't understand the concept of human exchange. Your dog could recognize many or all of the objects in the store, even though he doesn't have the cognitive power to even attempt to give them names. Your dog can understand on a very surface level what situations to expect if they've been in the same guitar store multiple times. Situations like other people will be there. You'll likely talk to those people. The dog can expect you to sit in a few places for an extended period of time and bore them with this strange sound you're creating. But dogs do not have the cognitive capacity to understand guitar store and apply that to every circumstance where the constituent lower concepts are assembled. Your dog would not be able to identify multiple new guitar stores. We can, and that's 
pretty darn magical. Never take that for granted. So when I call the concept of a guitar store an abstract concept, what I mean is it's a complex assembly of many objects and situations. It may be a physical location you can walk into, but it is not a simple object. The concept of guitar store is an assembly of many concepts from below it in the hierarchy, maybe even some higher level concepts as well. You may think guitar stores aren't that abstract. You can find one pretty easily and walk inside of it. But consider how intimately different every guitar store is when you get down to the granular detail and the fact that your brain instantly knows what to expect from a guitar store or how you know you've arrived at a guitar store without ever being there before. That's incredible. That is far more abstract than you realize and impossible for most other creatures on the planet. For another example, let's say you were in another place with the same objects. Still probably a guitar store, right? What if instead of a guitar store, you're at your friend's house getting ready for rehearsal? Your friend who just got off of work from his retail gig. Same objects, different abstract concept. This is to demonstrate it is not sufficient for our knowledge instinct to understand the objects or situations themselves in isolation. Our knowledge instinct allows us to understand the concept of guitar store in its unity of constituent objects and situations. Our mind has a malleable concept model of guitar store, just as we have one for cup. But guitar stores are a far more complex concept than cups, and cups can already have an infinite number of variables. This is a magnificent processing load for one situation, and our brains do this countless times a day naturally, by instinct, by the knowledge instinct. Because of the motivation we have from our knowledge instinct, every higher level concept evolved genetically and culturally with a purpose to make a unified sense out of many lower level concepts. In this process, lower level concepts acquire higher level sense or a meaning of making up something bigger something more meaningful than their lower level definitions. Like we talked about earlier, object concepts when imagined in the mind are vaguer than experiencing them in reality. But the higher level abstract concepts are even more vague in our minds, especially since we can't perceive them concretely with open eyes. Oddly enough, the more vague and less conscious a concept is, the more it can be mixed up with emotional contents. Perlovsky uses the example of talking about your favorite political party and how it can take more effort to separate your conceptual understanding of the topic or situations at hand from your emotional involvement in the higher level concept of politics. Now, I'm going to slightly spoil a concept from a later video, but Perlovsky seems to believe that music aids us in finding greater meaning in existence through aesthetic emotion communication. Remember when we discussed how aesthetic emotions are relevant to the knowledge instinct? This hierarchy of concepts is a basic outline of the map of the knowledge instinct, and music plays with the aesthetic emotions, which are present at all levels of the concept hierarchy. Greater meaning is when we understand how the lower concepts relate to the highest concepts. So if music assists us in finding more meaning, we can conclude music assists in the bottom up signal trajectory of the hierarchy of concepts. Music helps us with contextualizing the lower level concepts with our highest level concepts. From my previous example, when we looked at this tree, there is an inherent beauty and meaning to the tree, pleasant but vague when relating to our highest level concepts. When I contextualized the tree's existence to that of the eternal love and regret of a father, it became more profound. 
the lower level object concept of tree was related more strongly and concretely to the higher level concept of a father's eternal love. Now that may make you think, well, doesn't that mean that music is insufficient to touch the highest level concepts in the most profound way? That picture didn't take on nearly as strong of a meaning before you added words to it. That is a great observation, but does not fully embody the truth. We have to talk about language and the wholeness of psyche to really understand what's happening, but we're going to be saving that for the next video. There are just a few more thoughts I'd like to leave with you before we wrap this up. So remember the beginning of the video when I spoiled the ending for you by saying a bunch of gobbledygook you didn't understand? Well, let's repeat that one more time. The knowledge instinct influencing our hierarchy of concepts is where we derive meaning and appreciate aesthetic. The concepts located at all areas of the hierarchy are motivated by instinct and connected upwards or downwards by emotions. Remember, emotions connect instincts to concepts. When a lower level concept is contextualized better within the highest level concepts, it is there human beings find meaning and beauty. Music aids in this process. It makes a lot more sense now, right? And it's far more profound when you actually understand these complex concepts. The greater understanding that you have now after watching this video contributed to a much greater meaning when I said that summary again. And while this video is an art, I am positive you felt some emotion that touched beauty. This video alone should be a very good demonstration of the connection between beauty and meaning. So if we relate this back to Dan Levitin at the beginning of the video, saying that music releases dopamine, and if we examine the other processes that touch the same parts of the brain as music, when we say satisfy instinctual desires and therefore your brain is rewarded with dopamine, it finds a brand new context in relation to the knowledge instinct. Maybe things that relate to our highest level concepts, it makes them feel better understood by us, less vague, more whole, gives us a dopamine reward. Now, do you understand why I need to break these videos down so granularly? I do apologize that we seem to be moving both too fast and too slow at the same time, but it really is important to get all of this groundwork so you can really understand what music is and what it does and why we have it. All of this psychological groundwork will be worth it. I promise. Perlovsky recounts on meaning. Many of my friends, scientists, when asked, does your life have meaning and purpose? Will reply with great doubts. Nonetheless, as soon as the question is reformulated, so your life does not have any more meaning and purpose than that rock on the side of the road. At this point, most people agree that the idea of meaning and purpose of life might be vague and barely conscious, but it is so important that we cannot live without it. Life does not convince us that our lives have meaning and purpose. Random deaths and destruction abound but believing in one's purpose is tremendously important for survival. It is necessary for concentrating the will and power on achieving higher goals in life. This is why even a partial understanding of the contents of the highest concept models is so important. When we feel indeed our lives have meaning, in these rare fleeting moments, we feel the knowledge instinct satisfaction at the highest level as an aesthetic emotion of the beautiful. Again, I may be spoiling future topics, but Perlovsky really stresses in this book that meaning in one's life and the beautiful are extremely closely tied. When we experience something beautiful and we aren't sure why we connect with it, 
we're satisfying some of our highest concepts, something connected to us in a very literally meaningful way. To quote him, the considered theory of the mind predicts that emotions of the beautiful are related to the meaning and purpose of life, and not necessarily to specific colors or patterns on a canvas or specific sequence of musical keys. Meaning, we don't just happen to think art and music are pretty for their own sake. It touches something deeper and more important. It brings satisfaction to the highest level concepts. To emphasize just how groundbreaking this is, Perlovsky calls his own theory radical and says this is far different from anything taught in universities today in art or science. If you've read Kant or Aristotle speak on art, music, and the beautiful, this theory will fill in the scientific gaps they were missing during their lives. Again, there is a beauty in the unity. We'll be taking a look at the experimental evidence for this theory in a later video, but we still have one more topic to tackle in the psychology world to bring our foundation up to muster. How language and music play into the wholeness of psyche. I wanted to thank you all again for watching. And if you liked this video, please share it with those you love, uh, musicians, educators, anyone you think needs to see this video. I also wanted to remind you to listen to those seven songs linked in the description, you know, eyes closed, make sure you have no semantic information. Again, I strongly encourage you to purchase Leonard Perlovsky's book. A link to that is also in the description. I'm not taking a lot of credit for this because I'm merely presenting another man's life's work. And lastly, I would greatly appreciate the financial support, whether that's through Subscribestar at the link in the description, sending me a tip directly to PayPal, become the knight at gmail.com, or becoming a member of the channel through YouTube. Thank you all so much. I love you. Have a good day.